afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. How's your week been? Okay. Monday afternoon. Okay. So, um, welcome back to project management. And this lec or this this particular session, these these sessions build on each other and. In effect, uh, what we're doing is developing uh, a project plan and then looking how to monitor a project during its life cycle. So we're looking at every aspect of a project from its, um, from its initial stages right through to the end of the project. And after the project as well, where hopefully we get some benefits realization, so there's some tangible and intangible benefits to the project. I hope, I hope the theme of unmanned air vehicles is interesting. Of course, you can choose any, any project which is of interest to you. It doesn't have to be unmanned air vehicles. It could be something simpler, maybe a hobby, um, or even something more ambitious, say a, a very complex um, mega project or a project on a global global scale. I know when Brexit was happening, there was some focus on Brexit as a project, as maybe an interesting thing to try and project manage. So to give you some uh, practical focus. So uh, last week was just, well, what was an introduction and set the scene. I remember we looked at strategy so we were thinking of an organization, and what was its long-term long -term direction? What was its strategic objectives? So perhaps if you're an Airbus or an aerospace company uh, developing unmanned air vehicles, um, or maybe BA Systems. Drones are in the news lot at the moment for obvious reasons because of the conflict, um, parts of conflict in Europe. So drones are receiving lots of attention, um, perhaps for negative reasons. Um, uh, and it maybe focuses on just a point I want to make at the beginning, is that uh, uh, project management is quite complex. So you'll notice for, for something like an unmanned air vehicle, there's a, a degree of design. So we're talking about things like project scope and project objectives and we've also talked about deliverables but in some projects it's true that the customer doesn't know what they want they don't know their own requirements they don't know what to, therefore what a system looks like what a UAV looks like for example they just don't know that can happen with government for sure or any new technology so in those circumstances, I guess there's a, there's a project in its own right, or maybe part of the project, where a company like KPMG or Atkins Design or a you know, reliable consultancy firm will do that work, will capture requirements and do some conceptual design and do all the early stuff which allows us to start to name parts of a UAV system. So that kind of work where you might think, well, shouldn't there be some sort of work going on to actually understand the requirements in detail, come up with some quite complex conceptual designs? What does the UAV system look like in particular? They're fair questions, and I would say we've just got to assume that work has been done, maybe in a different project, or maybe as a specialist work package at the beginning to give us the information which are in these slides, which are in our view of project management. So the real world is more complex and messy um, and iterative. Sometimes you have to go back and forth and uh, stop a development cycle, go back to the beginning and different things. So that's, that's just a word just to say, well, if you think, well, hang on, where's the information come from to allow us to say what a UAV system actually looks like in the first place? Or actually, how do you manufacture this thing? Because how are you supposed to know the manufacturing steps before you've even concept designed it or even detail designed it? 
So we just have to assume that work has been done as part of another project or part of our project, we've not, we've not stated it up front. And I guess just to, just to follow on from that point, if you think of a company like BA Systems, they're a systems integrator. And you'll see in these slides there's an example of a nuclear submarine actually, a product breakdown structure from BA Systems. So how does BA Systems operate? Well, they have a strong supply chain. It's not uncommon for an original equipment manufacturer like BA Systems to do minimal manufacturing and design of some subsystems at all. They procure the subsystems and their role is to integrate the systems through assembly, through integration type manufacturing tasks and test. So some of these examples are assuming, and it's, diff it's, it's always dangerous to assume anything, that all that concept design and requirements and all this, all this early stuff which has to be done to name anything in the first place has been done by a supplier and they're actually supplying a subsystem which can be assembled. So from a BA systems perspective, their project management is about bringing together those deliverables and then assembling them and testing them. So all that concept design and detail design is done by the supplier. So therefore, in summary, if you see some things and think, where's that information come from? You just have to assume it's come from another project or it's actually just an assumption that we've got the information where it has to be developed. So that's just for completeness. Okay, so for today, it's from our teaching and scholarship theory. Um, this is what we should be able to do and what we're going to be testing you on um, in the first half of the course. We're going to look at project planning and look at these things, scope, scope management, and these breakdown structures. So we're going to have a look. Remember, we, we defined scope in the previous lecture. I'm just going to re reiterate the definition of that. And then we're going to start to think how we break down our, our project definition in terms of product and work packages. And what does that actually mean? So then when we've got our, our, our product, our deliverables, our product breakdown structure, our work breakdown structure, then we're going to be thinking about, okay, how do we convert this into a particular schedule where there's time involved? So there's timing of the work packages, the work packages um, consisting of the activities, the activities consisting of work packages. So you're going to from the initial stage of the project, from the scope, early stage of the scope statement, which we're going to show you an example of, then we're going to think about a product breakdown structure for our UAV, a work breakdown structure, then we're going to think about scheduling that in terms of timing, and then we're going to think about the resource implications. So there's our four basic things, and we're going to kind of critically analyze that as we go forward, the pros and cons, you know, the, the difficulties, the, the advantages, you know, the different techniques as well to, to give us some interest. So, yeah, so it's, it's beginning with the scope statement, then the PBS, the WBS, then the network diagram for the, for the scheduling, and then we're going to add resources. Because in our scheduling step, we assume the resources are available. But no, not in the real world, because resources are not readily available. Just look at the current job market. Lots of companies are struggling with capacity. They've just not got enough people, which is really impacting project management at the moment. All the project plans are, are really, have got, has to have strong risk management in terms of availability of resources. So you have to have risk management plans. We cover that in, uh, I think, lecture, lecture seven or eight, I think. So I'm just gonna give you a, a quick recap Remember from the last, from our last lecture, so I'll give you just a, a multiple choice question here. Can you remember what the generic stages of our project life cycle is? Just have a, 
a recap, healthy challenge, so that your brain's working again. Remember, we, we, we introduced a very basic project lifecycle and then gave you some more detailed examples of what happens in general, including British Standard and also because um, involved a bit in the defence sector, the CADMID cycle from defence, concept assessment, demonstration, manufacture, in service, and disposal. And in this session, we're going to go into more detail about the plan. So we, we've kind of covered a little bit about definition at the beginning, and we're going into the planning stage in this session. So there's some sort of continuity, mazy path we're walking through. Okay, I think the consensus has it. Yeah, so it's the generic stages, not the specific. I guess some of those specifics are out of phase anyway. They're kind of examples of, of things which are in projects but not necessarily generic stage. Okay, thank you for that. And now here's the next one, just to get our brains working. So what are the generic steps in the define stage of a project? So that's right, so we need to know our aim, we need to know our objective, we need to know our high level specification for the project, what's it going to look, what's it going to do in terms of high level parameters, the kind of things we're going to do during the project, again high level, and the kind of responsibilities for people. Good, okay, so moving on. So remember, we had this scope statement at the beginning. So I've written down a basic scope statement for the kind of UAV I'm using as a demonstrator on my side of the fence. Hopefully you, you're doing the same. And from, from my uh, experience of working in utilities and inaccessibility of infrastructure, because of fast-moving rivers, um, dangerous areas, railway stations. Um, in fact, with, with rail, uh, it would probably it, it would probably cost something of the order of millions of pounds to re to paint a gas distribution pipeline because it's near King's Cross. So um, the actual real cost there is the availability of track. You have to pay network rail to stop trains from moving. And as soon as trains stop moving, then they stop making profit and you have to pay them in compensation. So those are the, the kind of reasons. So my project objective follows a bit of a pattern. It says what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it, and how much. So I've decided to manufacture a fleet, a fleet of 10 unmanned air vehicles and the project should be finished in one year and not exceed full life cycle cost of 20 million. So my UAV is going to be an availability and capability contract. So 
I'm National Grid, and I'm buying off BA Systems, a fleet of UAVs, uh, under an availability and capability contract, and they're going to make available to me UAV capability, and it's their responsibility to keep them flying, keep them available, keep them maintained and upgraded for a specific contractual period. So I, I just have to lease them. So therefore I want those basic things happening, which is reflected in, uh, in, in usual contracts of this type on a UAV and operating base, a maintenance base and an over overhaul facility. So these are the kind of systems, from my experience, very basic, these are not, this is not technical aerospace by any means, uh, I'm not trying to be too serious about this. But I guess, you know, remember my point about how do you know what deliverables are going to be? Well, we're just going to have to assume that work has been done in, an, in another project. Or it's, you know, or there's been some sort of conversation with KPMG and Atkins and other suppliers, other stakeholders. And so these are our basic deliverables in our initial project scope statement. and uh, some milestones. So the deliverables form our input into the, bro the product breakdown structure. So we're moving forward and trying to put more information into a more detailed plan. So we're going to develop a detailed schedule and a schedule and plan including resources and times as much as possible. So remember we're just thinking of the principles. And here's some, some basic technical requirements. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the things which impacts us the most is maybe mean time between failure. Remember our, our triangle trade-off space, quality, cost and schedule. So mean time between failure is related to quality. You know, it has to be the highest quality technology. Uh, no risks being taken with, with unproven technologies, for instance. Sometimes in these types of projects, there, there's a betting game going on where, where the main supplier is almost betting on technology being available. You know, like, like uh, high technology companies like Google and Apple and all these things uh, are, are making new technologies as fast as possible. Well, sometimes companies in the high technology area almost guess that new technologies will be available in a year. So that's a kind of betting game. Um, it's safer to go for more reliable and available technologies, but perhaps, well, perhaps you'll be deemed backwards and won't win the market. So there's a bit of a betting game going on there, and it, it, it actually uh, it, um, it affects your risk management. And we have a, a continuing justification for our project, the business case. You, you've probably seen in the news that, um, uh, especially for UK government, the detailed business case is reviewed regularly, every so often. If it's a long project, it could be annually or at major decision points, major freeze gates or review points to make sure that the project is still viable. You know, we're spending money on this, therefore we want the benefits of the project. We want some sort of um, tangible and intangible benefits. The obvious one is profit, saving cost, for instance, but there are also the intangible benefits as well, uh, depending on which, which stakeholder perspective you're coming from. Okay, so that's our scope statement with some early information, high level information. So now we're going on to the planning stage. So we've kind of uh, gone through those early stages we talked about. We just tested ourselves on. And we're going into this, this, project, planning, this project planning stage. And it, it's really um, a lot of benefits to communication. So the project plan is your central almost battle plan around which you communicate and um, come together in terms of collaboration. And there are some basic things 
which are important and which impact your plan. And that's having the right expertise to develop it. Um, you must first develop the logic of the plan. So you, so you kind of work out how it fits together. And then you do some time estimates. So, so from, from my perspective as a, as a cost engineer, I'll be employed in trying to work out how long these activities will take and assuming a certain level of resourcing. So there might be a certain amount of software programmers, a certain amount of machining operators, a certain amount of assembly engineers available, uh, considering that there are other projects going on as well. So to make a time estimate, maybe I'm involved in aerospace maintenance, which is quite a complex and one-off activity. And I'm interested in specialist engineers who can disassemble an aircraft and maintain. Maybe some of the maintenance tasks are really unusual and no one has real experience of them. And there's a, it could be quite a long time, long duration on those activities. So the planning stage also helps us to think about cash flow as well. So in companies, cash is king. If you remember in the news a few years ago, there was this, pro, uh, this company called Carillion. And they, were, they had a, a really healthy customer list. They had lots of customers, especially motivated from the government. But they didn't have much cash. And with no cash, a company doesn't have any, any leverage doesn't have any power to operate. That was the famous uh, Carillion uh, demise, which left a major problem for the UK government in terms of having people to do work. So cash flow is really important. One of my colleagues uh, on a, at a lower level, maybe, was a, was a factory manager. Um, and he would be taking delivery of materials into the factory at certain times. And he wouldn't let he wouldn't let lorries come into the factory until at a very specified time, let's say 2.30 in the afternoon, mid-afternoon, because if he let them in earlier, he'd have to pay them, and he would lose a slight bit of money in interest. And if you aggregate all those, all those, um, all those losses over the year, it could, be, it, could, it could actually be quite significant. So the timing of the cash flow He's demonstrated there. You know, you, make, you used to make them wait outside. They said, okay, you can come in now. I'll sign this. We'll pay you now at 2.30. So he saves a few hours per, per transaction. So we looked, at, we looked at the scope definition last time, and that's, that's just a reminder of our scope definition in terms of the totality of outputs, outcomes and benefits. Okay, so our first step is, is going into the, the breakdown structures. You tend to break things down into more and more detail, into reasonable chunks of definition and work which are practical. In some project management uh, methodologies they say break it down until it's, it's, it's workable by a, 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 a manageable team of people. So they tend to break down the, the product definition until it can be worked on by a team of 10, 20 people, and they can be managed pragmatically and effectively. So it's, it's a really practical thing to do. And also, in, in breaking down the product deliverables, you also get a lot of opportunities to communicate and iron out those misunderstandings which cause those major project failures we saw in the first in the first part of the uh, in the first part of the uh, lecture lecture one so here's an example of a computer and it's pretty straightforward I guess just trying to communicate the principle remember the principle is important there will always be some slight nuance or complication of the real world in terms of uh, availability of information and design and hopefully Atkins can help us out with that in terms of uh, being able to uh, do that work outside of the project uh, or another stakeholder perhaps so you can see there's uh, 
is a kind of tree-like structure. You start, up, start off with a main deliverable uh, in line with the objective, and then you, you come out with the next, the next level, which, so the main unit mouse, keyboard, and monitor are all considered to be on the same level. And then the ones below, uh, you see the disk drive and the CPU, they're actually on the same level as well. So they're on the same level of the tree. And so on. So that's, uh, that's your, your typical product breakdown structure. Uh, this thing about nouns here, yeah, look, look for simple nouns. You see that uh, in, in lots of manufacturing management and engineering, the use of verb noun as a, as a way of uh, expressing something. You see it in value engineering as well, where you, uh, you state a function as what it does, and uh, it's, it's verb and it's noun. But here we're just looking at nouns at the moment as, uh, as what it is. So what is a noun in terms of a, a PBS? So here's my, here's my uh, clumsy view of my UAV. Very simple, very simplified view of, uh, of the equipment phase. It's not complete. I've not, got the, uh, I've not got the facilities in there or the maintenance space or anything like that. But I'm just doing that for, just for demonstration. So I've got a main unit control system, propulsion system, something at a payload. Uh, this is important for my application because I need to be able to take digital data and collect that data and be able to transmit it inside National Grid for it to be inspected by Asset Integrity and then for them to communicate with, with, uh, with project engineers in the networks to tell them what work has to be done. So there's, uh, it kicks off a major communication and operations type activities when we use this thing. Okay, so that's, you can see, you get the idea from that. I uh, did a bit more basic research just to uh, demonstrate some of the other products you might have in a, uh, in a UAV. That's a, a different type of UAV from probably about a decade ago. And here's an example of a nuclear submarine. So to give you some more, some more examples to understand. You can see how there's a, there's a logical numbering system or labeling system going on. So for example, for the weapon system there on the left, the Tomahawk missiles, the torpedoes and the countermeasures, they're all at the same level. So it's A1, A2, A3. And then the detection system, the sonar, mass, periscopes, radar, hydrophones, they're also at the same level. So there's another level below uh, these things. Uh, the, the pressurized water reactor has a primary circuit and a secondary circuit, and you've got the hull. So, so in fact, you've got the, in there you've got the product, you've got the first level, and then you've got the second level. And then you could go another level down, perhaps. So therefore, just to demonstrate that, to go down to the next level, you've got the secondary circuit, which is on the previous screen, if you remember. Let's just remember that. So the secondary circuit is C2. Remember the primary and secondary at the same level. And then underneath the secondary circuit at the next level down, you can see that tree-like structure. So they're all indented to the same level. So they're all the same level of indent. You see that a lot in software. The software deals with uh, product breakdown structures as an input. But you get lots of um, cost estimating software, analysis software, design, then if, if it's all at the same level of indent, uh, like bullets in a Word document, I guess, then they're all at the same level of, uh, of the product breakdown structure. 
So 2-1, 2-2, 2-3, 2-4, 2-5 and 2-6. Um, and then a reactor, coolant pump, pressurizer. So they're, they're one point something. Then if you were to go to the next level, it would be, say for the main condenser, if you were to break that down, it'd be 2.1 point one again. Point, uh, 2.1.1, 2, 3, 4. So you've got to kind of, uh, every time you go down to another level, you add a decimal point and start, and start the numbering system again. So that's your logical, that's your logical view. So, having said all that, can you have a think about the deliverables at the lowest level of your UAV system? We'll go back to Mentimeter again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not necessarily, this, not, not to nuts and bolts, to a reasonable, pragmatic level. Sometimes, sometimes it's in line with procurement. Uh, there's something called a packaging breakdown structure for, for contracts. Um, that's where, in more advanced work, you would, take, you would take the product breakdown structure and you would somehow try and move towards, is that, is that easy to give to a supplier? So, so you start to, I mean, in terms of mechanical engineering design, then in terms of systems and subsystems, uh, I guess there's a natural development through inputs and outputs and assembly interfaces and communication protocols and different things like that. So it becomes more of an engineering paradigm. But from a project management perspective, is it a bite-sized chunk of work? And can you give it to one supplier to, to make by itself? Because it, it, what can happen, what, ha, what has happened in traditional project management is that sometimes you get suppliers fighting each other. So if you, if you give a complex system to several suppliers, they will fall out. And sometimes, back to our political, remember our political question? What are the political factors? Um, in, in, old, in old money, in old supply chain management, when it was uh, poorly managed, or there's less modern methods, you'd find suppliers maneuvering to make the other supplier look bad in front of the customer. And different things like that, they'll look after themselves in terms of profit and getting things done. But um, it's a subjective thing, it involves your subjective engineering judgment, but also after being in this course, you should also understand the management perspective and why we're breaking things down from a management perspective. So it's a multidisciplinary thing. Yes, question? Um, in terms of, no, in, te uh, in terms of, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be manufactured at the same time, but it's at the, it's, they're at the same level of definition, maybe principally in terms of assembly. Um, say if you were to break down a propulsion system, I've just got propulsion system here, then you tend to manufacture propulsion systems in the same direction to save time. It's an axial assembly, design for manufacturing assembly. What they tend to do at Rolls-Royce is start with the axle and make sure that all components, a design decision is to make sure they're all assembled in the same direction. Because something which wastes time from a management perspective is from a performance perspective, if you think it's a great engineering choice to assemble something from the left and the right in different directions, it's a hell of a job for the assembly engineers who then waste loads of time setting up jigs, fixtures, all sorts of stuff on the shop floor. So they make sure there's a DFMA, Design for Manufacturing Assembly principle, of assembling things in the same direction to save time. So those sorts of specialist knowledge is almost isolated in, in the stakeholder. So if, if, I'm, a, if I'm an assembly engineer, um, in the old days, I'll be tearing my hair out because someone's made a design decision to make my assembly job really complex and waste loads of time for the business. Indeed, uh, I've seen in some engineering companies in the energy industry um, some design decisions where someone has made a very sharp corner on a, on, a, on a component or a part, which is a mechanical engineering part, which is a really uh, 
high stress point. And when you do the stress analysis, um, you get high stress points and it's very difficult to manufacture using a machine tool because the tolerance is such that you have to get a very unique high definition machine tool cutting tool to make that operation which wastes lots of time and money and it's specialist. So you want to be as standard as possible and you want to be observing design for manufacture principles, you want to be thinking, you want to be a systems engineer in terms of inputs and outputs, you want to be observing lessons learned, subjective experience, you want to be reducing complexity, you want to be thinking of your supply chain in terms of um, uh, what suppliers are out there to, to give you this sort of equipment. And if you're a cost engineer like me, you'd be thinking, actually, what I want is commercial off the shelf. I want stuff which exists um, in, in someone's product brochure somewhere, and I can point at it and say, yes, you make that already. I would like 20 of them. And they say, yes, we make them. They're very cheap because everybody wants them. So, so you've got all sorts of design decisions, remember being done by another project or, an, or a work package somewhere uh, in our nuanced complex world, um, which are making all these types of decisions. So it's, it's not easy, it's not simple, and it's messy and sometimes uh, it's iterative and, and sometimes you make changes when you shouldn't and, and different things like that. So that's a really, really moot question <laughs> from, from you. from. Uh, I don't know, it's really, that's, that's, the, that's the $64 million question, I think. Let's, um, let's think about this. What's I doing? I remember. Oh, did I not? I didn't ask you that question. You got away with that. Let's go for that. So having said all that, have a think about the lowest level of definition of your product breakdown structure. Let's see what you're currently thinking. <laughs> it's a bit like... Um, So, so, so try and think from your, from your current understanding of, I'm interested in what your current understanding of engineering is. You know, what's your current experience of engineering assemblies or, or subsystems or capabilities? Are you, are you studying systems in other, in other parts of your course? I'm interested in, in understanding. Are, are, you, are you kind of building up portfolios or projects of different, different real world mechanical engineering solutions. I know when I, when I used to teach, um, I used to teach NX CAD system, um, we used to use the Siemens, the official Siemens um, design material. And they, they used to demonstrate their CAD system with actual designs from say Dyson. So NX3 was demonstrated using the Dyson vacuum cleaner. And all the assemblies and sub-assemblies were, were actually in the uh, in the NX system demonstration to industry. I think the year afterwards, they had Dyson, and then the year afterwards for NX4, they had a, they had a, ski, uh, a ski vehicle, like you see in the Olympics, some sort of, um, uh, it's like an automated, like an automated toboggan was the NX4. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was automated. Yeah, NX4, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what they used to demonstrate NX4. NX3 was a Dyson vacuum cleaner. And uh, with, with, with CAD systems in industry, sometimes they've got they've got troubleshooters in industry because their CAD models get so complex they fall over and they don't they can't work out what's wrong with them because it's so complex. But, uh, Okay, so you've got a variety of, you've got fuselage, avionics, structures, 
So you're separating the, the mech engine, the electrical and electronic engineering, which is, um, which is yep, typical, common practice. Okay, that's... Uh, So having done the same job myself, doing a, a product breakdown structure for a particular company, this com the company I worked with didn't do any manufacturing assembly or, uh, or even commission or installation of their equipment. They didn't do anything. They were a design, so-called design authority. So they did all the design and then all the tangible work, um, all, the, uh, all, the manufacturing, all the manufactured components, an assembly and then their equipment was installed on ships uh, and even uh, decommissioning was done by contractors so um, all they did was design it was quite quite an interesting uh, thing so so what you do is you break down your product breakdown structure to the lowest level and then you think okay we've got the what so now, how are we going to do the how? How are we going to make, how are we going to deliver these, these detailed lists of deliverables? So we get this uh, work breakdown structure, and again, we've got the similar type of logic in terms of the top level, the second level, and then the indent, where we've got an extra decimal point. So every time you add another decimal point, you're going down to another level of detail. So you get, this is our logical view of a word breakdown structure. So uh, in terms of some of the tasks in my propulsion system, I've not put the logical numbers on, but um, there's some typical things you would do in terms of actually producing a motor deliverable. Of real critical interest is a test. Anything you do, you must test. Otherwise, you know, you could have some severe safety events destroying the company in the future, which you weren't aware of because you didn't, you didn't arrange and define the right test. So designing the test is really, and designing the right test is really important for some of these, for some of these projects. So going back to our, our nuclear sub example, and uh, you can see some of the, in the kind of grey, grey colour, you can see some of the actual operations there like fabricate pressure boundary, add vessel internals, add tubing to lower shell, weld lower shell and drum together. So they're specialist kind of um, vessel type operations. You know, some uh, in the shipbuilding industry, one of the difficulties they have is making sure that what they've actually made is still represented by the CAD system they've, they've designed it in. So the digital model doesn't necessarily precisely fit the actual thing they've made because of warpage, um, expansion because of temperature, slightly different tolerances on parts. So when they weld things together, you've got a different ship than you have in the CAD system. And they have to what has to be done is you have to use a metrology system and zap it with lasers to work out exactly where everything is after it's been assembled because it's, it's, a, it's a kind of slightly unwieldy structure. It's not, it's not very precise. So you do have to have metrology equipment. Okay, so there we are. So, so back, back to our Mentimeter. So 
So in building your, your project for your, your, your UAV, I should say activities. Yeah, 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 yeah. If it's if it's uh, if it makes sense in in the context, we want to break things down to to the best level of detail. I guess an optimal level of detail. Otherwise, you could end up working on something where you got the, well, this could be broken apart and made simpler. How are we doing? Interesting. The aerodynamic optimization is interesting. As a, as a, if, if you've got CFD skills in this world, using digital, your world, the world is your oyster. In terms of uh, uh, being an, uh, an aero engineer, if you've got digital skills, computational fluid dynamics, if you've got the, the theory. You can do the calculations. You can do it very well. Then it's a it's a good foot on the good foot on the ladder to, to going where you want to go. Structural testing, good. Parts manufacture. Wind tunnel testing. The world, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, if you look at the Formula Formula One, Formula One industry, uh, for a long time because it's it's completely performance driven in Formula One. So for many years, cost was not cost was not an op no was, was no object. It didn't matter. They had to win. Performance, performance, even. To the detriment of safety, sometimes you know some safety systems were ignored because they would somehow, from the driver's perspective, affect performance. But then, after the last recession, people started to talk about business case, project management speak. What's the business case for this new wind tunnel you want for the F1 Red Bull F1 team? What's what's going on? Justify your expenses. So it, um, perhaps it will be the same again with inflation and all sorts of supply chain issues, that um, such uh, things will happen again. Okay. So basically our breakdown structures provide the vehicle, the platform for our plan going forward. So. Remember, we, you've kind of got some sort of insight into the complexity of the decision, actually. How subjective it is from a, an engineering perspective, and how you need as many, as many perspectives as possible to, to get the optimal plan. But it, performs, it, it starts to form the basis of what we call the Performance Measurement Baseline, PMB. And that is the, that's the platform from which you measure progress. So after you've detailed planned the project, you then start to execute the project and compare the progress you're making against the performance measurement baseline, which, which brings forward the really obvious yet ignored thing is that if you don't spend enough time at the beginning on planning and making the most optimal decisions, which from a practical perspective includes really engaging stakeholders from a wider perspective as possible, which involves organisation and, and, and hard work and uh, blood, sweat and tears. If you don't engage your stakeholders, you'll produce a suboptimal plan, suboptimal performance measurement baseline, and miss loads of opportunities to save effort and come up with the best possible 
outcome for the customer, for everyone involved. And people invariably, although things are getting better, make suboptimal decisions uh, based on that. And there are plenty of examples where there have been poor planning. See, the best way to manage risk, for example, is in taking the time to manage your suppliers in the best way possible, which means engaging the right suppliers as well. So that's, that's a management problem. And that's an experience-driven problem. That's something you learn the hard way. So you, you, know, you can go on projects and see that there's lack of engagement with a wider stakeholder community and understand that your project team is not necessarily experienced enough to be able to do that effectively, for example. So we're forming the performance measurement baseline. And OK, so we've, we've done our first bit. We'll have, a, we'll have a mini break at 3, at 4 o'clock, is it? 3, 4, this is, I think, an hour behind. Yep. We'll have a mini break at 4, so just, a, just, another, just another little bit before we uh, have a conversation, private conversation. So we've developed the breakdown structure. Now we're starting to go on to the network. So what do we know? We know, we know we're going to make, we know what. Um, we've, got, we've got the work packages, so we kind of know how in principle, but now we've got to work out when. When are we going to do these things? So it's our, our network logic, which is, the, which is the next step. So we've got, we're going to build a logical network a graph, as it were, if you're a mathematician, you would call it a graph. A graph, a logical, a graph of our, our work packages, actually our, our activities. Um, if you want a little bit of detail, then activities are made up of several work packages, but we're assuming that work package is the same as an activity in our case, but you tend to, you tend to assemble activities from different work packages. So there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of complication there, which isn't necessary to fully, fully get on board. It's, it's on the peripherals, that one. So we're interested in, in what, are the, what are the logical relationships between our activities in terms of you can only start this one when this one is finished. So it's a, it's a, it's a start-finish logical relationship. And it's called precedence. You see, you see the word precedence in operational research a lot. It's about this. Um, it's about this logical type of relationship. So precedence relations are what, what we're dealing with. And we've not we've not thought about resources or time yet. So we'll, so no, step one, we think about what are the logical connections in terms of start and finish for our activities. Then we think about, OK, well, how long are these activities estimated to take? So we have some form of duration estimate from someone like me, cost engineer, providing advice. Um, then it's quite a complex task. And after the, after, the, after the duration estimates, basically the duration estimate has an assumption that the resources are available. So I'm assuming at the duration at estimation stage, I have any resources available, and I'm going to use them at a reasonable consumption rate. You know, perhaps, perhaps normal consumption rates of, uh, of resources. But it's an assumption. Then once we finish the network, we then go on to resource management. We think about the resource implications of that, which is the last bit we do today. So what's all that about? So this is a, this is a theoretical view, a theoretical view of the logic of what, I, of what I've been talking about. So you've got this main diagram here, which is the activity on node. And you can see you've got these, you've got these main quantities. The earliest start time, the earliest finish time, that's what they're called. And on the bottom there, you've got the latest start time and the latest finish time. So they're in the corners of this, of this square. 
You've got your activity number, which is a label, which is in the table actually. You can see the activity numbers in the table. So there's some sort of just a logical labeling of activities. And you've also got the duration at the top, the top middle. So that's, that's my time estimate. Go into more detail about that later on in the course. And you've got this thing called float, which we're going to calculate. And you'll see what float is um, very quickly when you look at the diagram. And so you can see here that there's, there's something going on with something called predecessors. So what's that? What are predecessors, you might ask? So those, those are the links between the activities, which will become oh so clear when you look at the network diagram. So the predecessor to seven is six. Predecessor to six is three and four. So what does that mean? So, so what that means is, for six to start, its predecessors of three and four must finish. So there's, a, there's a, an arrow going from both three and four and ending at six. So they converge, they merge together at uh, activity six. And activity six can only start when three and four are finished. And that's the same statement right throughout. So activity four can only start when six and seven is finished. And activity two can only start when three, four, and five are finished. So from that information, you can build a network. And you can put these boxes on each on each activity. Each activity has a box with the duration, the activity number, and we're going to work out the others, these things, through our network. So we're going to work out, calculate these things. So that's our, that's our network. That's the, that's the resultant network from that table. I've left, I've left the key there in the bottom right for you to understand which, because I, um, I think the screens have, uh, have blown, blown out the cyan, the cyan nature of the boxes somewhat. Yeah, I can't really see them. Okay, so I'm going to give you a five minute break to, to kind of just, just reflect on that, try and work that out. And, uh, have a conversation for five minutes. We'll be back online at five past four.
series of games, but he's a and he's done a few for the last night, and he's still going to so, Thanks, sir. Yep. All right. Thanks the question. Yeah, no worries. Hello. Hello. Oh, uh, hello. Welcome back. So our next stage is to is to look at this activity diagram in in a bit more detail. Uh, it's actually broken down step by step, but hope, I don't know whether you've been able to work it out just by just by your own analysis. But you can see. You can see that at the beginning we've got activity one, and then you've got activity two. And look, activity two can't start until one is finished. So you've got the arrow indicating that logical logical relationship. Then, if you look at activity three, that can't start until two is finished, and that's the same for four and five. So you can see how the activities are labelled in the middle, so they're in the the middle of the box, sorry, the, the cyan, I think the projector light can't pick up the cyan shade, which is on the slides. It's a bit too bright, perhaps. So you can see that three, four, and five are, have something in common. They can't start until two is finished. Um, then if you look at uh, then, uh, activity six, you can see that that has a logical dependency on three and four. So it has to wait for three and four to finish before six can start. But it doesn't care about doesn't care about activity five. Um, and activity seven can only start when five and six has finished and doesn't care about four, for instance. So there's no link between four and seven. It doesn't matter. Seven can start without four. So I've put numbers on there. Um, because it, to, to emphasize the logical relationships. If I put words in there, then things would get a bit more subjective, and we could have a conversation about whether these precedence relations are actually true or not. Maybe you could argue about the links between the different uh, named activities. So that's, that's the logical side of things. So if I didn't have any durations, I would just build this logical this logical thing, but uh, it doesn't tell us anything about when things are going to happen and how long they take. Well, that's, that's reflected in the time estimation, which will have a basis. So uh, it, my, role in, my role in industry and, and research is to come up with a scientific basis for these duration numbers. And um, having a single point number is a very bold statement, but that's how the world works. Just give me a number. is. Uh, it happens a lot. So this, this, is, this is what you would do. So if you had the, let's assume we got the durations now as well. So we've done the logic, and we've also got the durations. So we can start to fill in the other boxes, the early start. I don't know if the mouse is visible. Yes. Uh, so let's say we're starting on the beginning of day zero, or the end of day zero, we'll call it the end of day zero, as long as you're consistent. So if we start at the end of day zero, then we've got a duration of um, two, like so. So if I've got a duration of two, then this will finish. The earliest, time, the earliest time this can finish is at the end of day two. If I start at the end of day zero, as long as I'm consistent that I'm talking about the end of a day here, it's taken two days, so at the end of day two, so when's the earliest this one can finish? Well, it's got this logical relationship. The earliest this can finish has got to be uh, the earliest this can start, sorry, is, uh, is the same time as the earliest this can finish. So this starts at the end of day two. And remember consistently saying the end of day two. 
so I'm being consistent with end of. Then you've got the duration of four, and the earliest it can finish is the end of day six. So now things get a bit more complicated, because we've got, uh, we've got a burst, a so-called burst activity here. So it's, uh, it, more, more activities follow it than, than, uh, than one, greater than one. So now, so, so the earliest these can start are all at the same time, because they're all linked to the same, the same uh, connector here. And, but they've all got different durations. So 12 is the longest, 8 is the shortest. So if we take each box separately, so the earliest this can finish, the earliest it can start is the end of day 6, it's consistent with this connection. It takes 10, 10 days or 10 weeks or 10 units of time. And the earliest it can finish is the end of, let's say, day 16. But this is different across the board, so this this is a duration of 8, so it's the end, end of day 14. This is a duration of 12, so therefore that's the end of day 18. So that's 6 plus 10, 6 plus 8, 6 plus 12. And we're being consistent with saying it's the end of the day. Um, we, could, uh, we could turn it around and call it the beginning. You know, if I was being consistent, but it's got to be the end of day 2, because it's, it's duration of 2 days at the beginning. So it's got to be the end. Like so. So uh, just just to mitigate that confusion, sometimes people get the end of and beginning mixed up. So being consistent, it takes two day, two full days, end of day two, and so on. Consistent. So you get you get to activity six, and because of these logical connections, uh, this activity is taking longer. Well, this activity, the earliest it can finish is on the end of 16th day, because this is already finished at the end of day 14. But we have to wait until they're both available for this to start, because it's a, it's a merge activity, like so. And so therefore, the earliest, this, the earliest it can start is the end of day 16, which kind of, uh, if you think about it, makes sense. Like so. so, so it depends on the duration, the connections, and being consistent that this is the end of something, end of that day, end of, end of the 16th day. Um, so if we take, uh, take this uh, activity 6, then um, if you've got a duration of 12 days, and this, this is the earliest it can finish is the end of day 28. Remember, this is the earliest finish time in this box here like so. And we're doing the same over here. So the earliest this can start is the end of day 6, 12 days duration. The earliest it can finish is the end of day 18. However, we've got, we've got a merge activity here, so we have to wait until this one, the longest, the activity which has the, the kind of uh, largest number in this box, basically its earliest finish time is, is actually further out than this one. So for this to start, it has to have both this and this. <coughs> Excuse me. Both of these finish. Remember, this can only start when they've both finished. And so the earliest this can start is the end of day 28. Then the, the, early, the earliest the entire network can finish is therefore end of day 32. So you, you, that, that's your forward pass. That's termed the forward pass of the network. So what do we do next? So what we do is just think if you, if you made a kind of physical structure out of this. You made, you made this into a, into a physical structure and uh, mapped the durations to lengths. Uh, so you could therefore see the flexibility in the structure in terms of how it can bend backwards and forwards depending on the flexibility in these in these times. So you could see it physically if you made a model and, and mapped mapped the durations to lengths and, and connected everything up. You could probably you know if you imagine like a concertina, you'd have some room to compress 
um, certain bits of the structure. So which bits of the structure could you compress? Well, what you could do is go backwards from here and work out something called latest finish time and latest start time. And we'll work out where the, where the flexibility in our model would be. And that would be the float. That would be our, our flexibility in time to start and finish a, uh, an activity. So that gives us some sort of indicator where we've got flexibility in our plan. So this is our backward pass. So we're going to go backwards um, as we go through. So what does it mean? So what happens is, is that this is now the latest finish time, which is the end of day 32. And we've got a duration of four. So the latest start time is the end of day 28. And we use the same logic and go backwards. So you've got, you've got two connections here. So the, the latest finish time is the same as the latest start time between this one and this one because of the connection. There's no connection here, so it doesn't matter. So let's do the same thing. So we've got, uh, we've got a duration of 12, end of day 28 minus 12 becomes an end of day 16, being consistent, end of, like so. And we do the same kind of calculation over here. 28 minus 12, you get 16. Uh, there's only one connection from here to here, so, so you transport the 16 over here effectively. And there's only one connection here, so you transport the 16 over here effectively. There's only one connection here, so the 28 goes over. Take the 12 away, you get the 16. Now it gets interesting here, well, we've ended up with these later start times of 6, 8, and 16. So our later start time, in terms of going backwards, be careful, this is where people make a mistake, you see, on the exam. People make the same mistake. Um, you've got to take, I mean, you can't start this at the end of day, you can't have your latest finish time at the end of day, uh, say, 16. Can't start, you can't start this going backwards at the end of day 16 because this lot is still going. And you've got this, this can't go backwards until these three are finished. So it's exactly the same calculation going backwards as it is going forwards. You're doing the same calculations, you're just using different concepts, which mean slightly different things. But, um, so in effect, you've got to pick the smallest number because you can't start something. You can't start this at 16 because this hasn't finished yet, going backwards. So you take the smallest number going backwards and you get this. This is the latest finish time. And then you've got the duration four, so you get the two here. One connection, take the two there. Duration of two, you're back to zero. So you've kind of you've gone forwards and you've gone backwards. And because of the logical connections and durations, then you, you've got this thing called float, which is in the middle, the middle, um, middle box in the, in the middle there, which is the amount of flexibility in terms of time. And you'll notice that the one, the numbers in red are zero, like so, and there's no float there, there's no flexibility. So what does that tell you as a planner? If you've got no flexibility, if you've created that plan with durations and you've got no flexibility in those particular activities, what does that tell you if something goes wrong? If something takes longer on that path than you planned, the whole project is late. Whereas the stuff with floating, the flexibility, these numbers, 
these numbers tell you that if something is delayed, you've got a bit of time there before things start to go critical. In other words, the whole project suffers. So the, the, the activities with float, you've got flexibility. The activities with zero, you've got no flexibility. That's your critical path, and it's the longest path through the, through the project. And if something goes wrong, then the whole project is wrong because it's on the critical path. So everyone, anything which is on the critical path, you need to be managing it on top of the critical path. That's your focus. And it's the, um, it's the focus of Elihu Goldratt's work on the goal and also something called the critical chain, which are some classic intellectual works um, from, from a chap called Eli, Elihu Goldratt. And he wrote, he's a really well known in manufacturing and project management. And he wrote some, he wrote these novels, these kind of business novels, which are, they read like novels, they're really accessible, but they're, they're explaining his principle, his thinking, his theory on the theory of constraints, which is to always manage the bottleneck. It's to think about time and think about the bottleneck of an activity, which is really important in a manufacturing organization where you need to be focusing all your effort on the machine which is holding everything up. So you need to identify the bottleneck. It's called the theory of constraints. And there's a whole theory around that. So our, our bottleneck is a critical path. So we need to be thinking about the critical path and how we're going to manage it. And Goldratt has things to say about that. Is there any questions? We, we, we practice this in a tutorial next week. So there's a, it's, it's basically a workshop next week where I just get you to answer questions and I walk around and help you out. So that's the, so next week's a, a tutorial. Rather than, a, rather than a lecture. So that's, that's the theory. Um, so that's the network done. So who, who is responsible for the work? So we also have an organizational breakdown structure as well. So the organizational breakdown structure might be in simple terms design, manufacture, test facility, quality, the quality management department, human resources, and so on. So you have, you have a breakdown in the organization in more and more detail um, of different departments in different places in the organization. So for our UAV type organization, we'd have different parts of, uh, say, BA Systems in Wharton. Um, probably principally all based in different, different places. In Airbus, you'd have, um, you have Broughton, maybe in Chester for the wings. And you'd have Toulouse, I think, for the assembly of Airbus, where they assemble the aircraft in just in time. So you've got different bits of the organization. And you break the organization down, just like you did for your products and your work. And you work out who is responsible for each work package. So we're not, you know, I've got a few examples of that, but basically, basically you break things down into, into each department and work out who, in, which, in what parts of the organization, at an appropriate level, is responsible for a particular, um, particular activity. And they become a kind of cost account holder. So they're responsible for the budget for that particular activity in the network. So for example, there you've got the search committee at 1.4.1 is, um, has a cost account in, in the information systems department. And develop criteria has cost accounts in information systems, human resources, and procurement uh, departments to give different totals. So we work out different cost accounts within the organization. 
So that's the purpose of the organisational breakdown structure, is that we break down the organisation and work out who is holding the budget for which activity. And we therefore we create cost accounts, which are actual, the cost account is actually designated by a code number and it appears in the finance system, in the enterprise resource planning system, and you're able to see things like invoices, um, and, uh, and cash amounts, and when they've been paid, uh, and so on. So we've seen, we've seen the critical path as being the longest path through the network, and our, our project is, is a live thing, you know, it's, uh, it's constantly changing because of risks, because things are happening in the outside world, which are impinging on our project, and our project becomes you know, uncertain in places, we go, we're delayed in some activities, and some activities become early, so the project is a live kind of thing which we're always actively managing. So, so okay, so we've got the, we've got the, straight back to the beginning, we've got an, an organisational strategy which requires projects. We've selected our project based on return on investment, um, intangible criteria, increased market share, increased capability of the organisation, um, a better reputation of the company, maintaining its uh, competencies and skill levels. And then, okay, we pick that project, we've created a scope statement, which includes you know, objective, very high level, objective, deliverables, milestones, technical requirements, justification, ongoing justification, and uh, also exclusions. And then we've gone on to start to, to create our plan in terms of a product breakdown structure, a work breakdown structure, an organisational breakdown structure. So we've got the deliverables, the, the activities, and the people who are holding the accounts for those activities who've got a budget per activity. And we've got our network diagram in terms of when things are going to happen and how long they're going to take. So next we've got to think about, we assume the resources would be available. We assumed in our naive, perfect world that all the resources we planned for, we assumed would be available, or that actually have been designed, um, the work has been designed so that it requires a certain level of resource to complete. We've assumed that will be there. You know, we can only, we can only produce a propulsion system with um, so many thousand person hours, uh, so many kilograms of raw materials, so many numbers of bought out parts, so many consumables. So from a designer's point of view, that's what we need to do to complete the work. However, in the real world, the resources are not necessarily uh, fully available. So what are the resources that are in our plan which could cause us the problems in terms of resource management. So there are, there, are, there are several, you know, types of resources. So you can think about resources by categorizing them somehow. So that's why we, that's why we categorize resources so we can think about them in a, in a constructive and theoretical way. So you could have some skilled people and you pay them more money because they add more value and they're not as available because of the work they've had to do to acquire those skills and experience uh, than, than people who are still working towards that experience. So your more experienced and skilled people will be under demand if you're a high technology company. And which is why recruitment is really important, which is why you as undergraduates will be targeted by high technology companies to be part of their resources in projects. So in some years time, companies will be planning on an intake of skilled graduates to um, populate their portfolio and their current projects. You'll be part of someone's plan 
going forward and even longer term they'll be thinking okay in 10 years time we'll have so much percentage of experienced graduates some will have moved on some won't and so on so you're part of someone's long-term strategy as a uh, as a resource in a project and you've got these other types of resources even buildings you know, the, the capacity to do work um, in the uh, uh, in the globalization the globalization strategy of manufacturing people built lots of facilities in the east where there's so-called low-wage economies and where they're actually a resource of skilled people in local areas so organizations build resources like facilities um, in globally advantageous places I know like for example Dyson was going to set up in Singapore uh, their factory to produce um, I think it was an autonomous vehicle of some sort which they went back on but I remember that in the news where uh, it's a typical example of a high technology company looking to build facilities in an economic and skill level advantageous part of the world so you've got different resources now there's something which um, which you might realize when you look at the network diagram what tends to happen in projects is that you build your plan and did you notice at the beginning there wasn't much work going on and then as, as time went on more and more work developed and then the kind of work petered out in terms of finishing activities that is typical of, um, of projects so much so that you get lots of resource in the middle or in particular parts of your project you suddenly find you've got lots of people working on different things now why is that dangerous um, can you think can you think why that could be that could be a particular problem if something went wrong you you could um, if something went wrong in another project and you've got lots of people over here on this project and suddenly another project wants lots of people all at the same time and they you know they, they've got a peak in their resource profile for example so how what are the different ways having lots of resource working on something at any one time is problematic for your project for the organization you know there are many many different ways that could be a problem can you read that resource histogram can you see that there's a number of activities going on there 1 to 12 and you can see for each activity they're using a certain number of uh, let's say days of resource and if you add up if you add up these numbers here or these numbers they correspond to the amount of resource being consumed at this part of the project so this particular so-called Gantt chart or project plan is using different amounts of resource let's say the same type of resource as well let's say it's all um, assembly or machining or even all design work if you're a design authority then you could be using lots of designers all at once because that's how you plan the project so you need to smooth you need to smooth that resource uh, and that that's to try and mitigate the risk of something happening now in, in the process industries every year they shut down oil rigs pharmaceutical plants um, uh, petrochemical they shut down their facility at like Ineos and places like that in Scotland they shut down for a week two weeks and they, they go through a shutdown and turnaround period where they just inspect everything for any faults um, it's called a, a shutdown and turnaround project and they've got lots of people who are dismantling parts of say say Ineos in Grangemouth in Scotland to see if any of the machinery or, uh, or catalytic uh, processes are going to break or are broken somehow sometimes they open they open a machine and a blade has come off 
and it's, uh, it's going to completely fail. It's partially failed, it's going to completely fail. And they have teams in all sorts of different parts of INEOS. And the point is with Petrochemical that as soon as you shut down the plant, they stop making profit. So the race is on to inspect and maintain the plant in that two week period to the, to the biggest effect um, and then be able to, to, to then start up again and as soon as they start up they start making barrels of oil if it's the refinery they start making medication again if it's for the pharmaceutical industry they start to make profit and so they have to have this two week shut down for regulatory purposes and also, if they didn't maintain the plant, they could be shut down for months if something really broke. So imagine if your inspection project had this resource profile, then if something went wrong, then your shutdown and turnaround could suddenly turn into three weeks, and someone's going to lose a lot of bonus in the city somewhere, because um, there's not going to be much profit for a week, for example. So that's why you should do this resource smoothing. And the reason why you do the resource smoothing, or how you can do the resource smoothing, is to use the float, the flexibility in your plan. So there's some important points here about how to optimize resource allocation. And there's some rules of thumb you can try to try and uh, minimize any delay and fluctuations. So resource availability is impacted by all those things. Maybe you've got no overtime in your plan, and that's an opportunity. We've talked about skills, holidays, different things it can impact your, your work plan. So from my own experience, uh, uh, the high pressure pipelines for National Grid, which are the higher pressure pipes on the edges of towns, for example, or, um, or sometimes you know, they're, they're, they're not necessarily on the edges of towns actually. But the contractors who work on that are not necessarily available all the time as a resource because they are, they're a profit making organisation and they have other customers, other national grid regional, um, other national grid regional centres as customers and also peculiarly they also work in Canada where there's lots of uh, requirements for this sort of work. So assuming your resource is available if you have a high pressure repair project is, is folly, as they say. You know, um, you have to be aware of the commercial reality and the capacity of your supply chain. So, um, having the contractors available is not necessarily a given, and it's a it's a factor, a political factor as well, in your in your resources. So, this guy Goldratt. Um, came up with this idea of a, a critical chain. So what does that mean? So Goldratt was all about saying, look, the critical path, if we don't manage the critical path, if something goes wrong, the whole project will be delayed. We've got no float. But hang on a minute, there's other projects going on and they're all using specialist design resource. So let's say they're all using specialist designers. So if something goes wrong in another project, that resource becomes unavailable and it impacts our project. So if we don't look outside of our project and our specialist and uh, rare critical resources, then we're not aware of the critical chain. So the critical chain is, is actually where your specialist resource is working on other projects at different times. So there's a critical chain of activities in different projects which show where your critical resource is and that if it's delayed, that person won't be on your project and will delay your project. And so your critical path could be delayed because 
you're waiting for your design specialist who's held up on another project and it's outside of your vision. So the critical chain is the, is the chain of activities in different projects where your design specialist is working at different times on different tasks for different projects. He's multitasking across several projects. And that was termed the critical chain. And the way he solved that gold rat was to talk about buffers. He placed buffers in different parts of his project plan. And there was an optimal way of doing that based on his theory. So he had something called resource buffers where he had, he put in his plan buffer time, um, which is uh, uh, some spare time in case your resource is delayed. He also put buffers on the end of the critical path. Um, so there's a buffer on the end of the critical path of the project. There's a buffer where there's a critical resource in the critical chain. So the critical chain across the different projects has these buffers. So there's a resource buffer, the project buffer, and there's also some other buffers where you've got some parts of the network which are feeding into the critical path where you think it would be good to have a buffer there as well. So the principle is, is to use buffers at the project level, the critical path level, at feeding level and at resource level to give yourself some, some contingency if things go wrong at those points. And that's what the critical chain is about. So let's see if this works. What is critical chain project management? To explain CCPM, we first need to understand the critical path method. Critical path is a method for scheduling projects based on task dependencies. If you want to learn more, watch the video linked in the description. Critical chain project management is an update to critical path that focuses on the availability of resources, people, equipment, and physical space. The critical chain is a string of resource-dependent tasks. Critical chain project management is a little more realistic than critical path, as it recognizes that constraints and bottlenecks are a part of any project. It also switches the concept of float for buffers. We'll learn more about these later. CCPM was first introduced in the 1990s by Eliyahu M. Goldratt in his work on Theory of Constraints, or TOC, which focuses on identifying and fixing bottlenecks to improve workflow. So what are the main principles of critical chain project management? CCPM acknowledges that no company has infinite resources, so you have to factor that into your project plan and schedule. It asks teams to treat projects almost like a relay race. When a task is finished, you must be ready to start the next one immediately. It also takes into account Parkinson's Law. Work expands to fill the time allotted. It does away with due dates, asking teams to focus on finishing tasks as fast as possible. Buffers of time can be used to make any adjustments needed. The critical chain is the sequence of dependent events that prevent the project from being completed within a shorter time frame. CCPM discourages multitasking. Instead, teams should concentrate on finishing the most important tasks one at a time. Now that you know what CCPM hopes to achieve, here's a brief explanation of how to use it. Firstly, you should identify your project's critical path, or the sequence of tasks that must be completed for the project to be successful. Then, you slash every task's duration by at least half. This safety margin is pulled into what is called a project buffer, a period of time set before the project's completion date that allows for any adjustments to be made. Next, locate the critical chain path by leveling your resources. Adjust the task dates based on resource availability and arrange tasks according to resource dependencies. Now you can start inserting your buffers. Buffers are pockets of time that allow any unexpected issues to be rectified without delaying the project's delivery date. We mentioned the project buffer earlier, but there are three more types of buffers used in CCPM. 
A project buffer is inserted between the last task and project completion date to ensure the final date doesn't change. A feeding buffer is set at the end of non-critical chains to prevent any delay to the critical chain. A resource buffer is set at the beginning of the critical chain to ensure it has the essential resources. And a capacity buffer sets on-call resources in case of unforeseen issues. Although CCPM is a relatively new concept in project management, it has been hailed as one of the most practical and important PM techniques. It helps to get projects to completion more quickly, allows project teams to focus on their tasks, improving productivity and efficiency, and helps reduce overall project costs. However, with its focus on getting tasks done as quickly as possible, CCPM does not deal with project quality. There's also been some debate over the optimal duration of tasks and buffers. Task owners will always overestimate the time needed to complete work, so things may still not get done as quickly as they should. CCPM requires full commitment from your project team to be successful. Think CCPM could be helpful for your projects? Wright can help you implement critical chain project management in your organization. Wright's resource management tools give you unparalleled visibility into your team's workload. View availability at a glance drag and drop to reprioritize tasks, and allocate resources with ease. Monitor team and project performance and improve future resource planning with customizable reports. For more information on Reich's project management software, check out our YouTube channel. I thought that would be useful, just as some high level concepts. So... Oh. Okay, so... So I'd ask you to, we'll go through these points at the beginning of the tutorial next week because they'll be more, they'll be more easily um, so the tutorial is in your, it's, it's in your timetable I think it's perhaps, is it on a different day? Okay, so that's perhaps I have to, uh, that's a good point. I have to uh, sort that out. So, because I, I want to go into a little bit of detail of this, just to be clear. And I think at this time, it's going to be tiring for everyone. So I'll leave that to the beginning of the tutorial, like a ten-minute session. But I think you've seen how you've seen how there's a there's a process. Of, of planning, so you're going to a, a, a plan in place which acknowledges activity, duration and resources and has to be realistic and there are all sorts of strengths and weaknesses to that due to the real world and how there's different stakeholders who have such a, a tremendous impact on the success of the project that it's not just a process, it's the real world and how it interacts with that process, which is important, I think. So th thank you, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'll see you next week. I'll look at the timetable myself. I thought it was uh, a bit different. And uh, any questions, uh, please send them to the, dis to the discussion board. And please look out for any announcements as well, because I, I might put some extra learning material about critical change. I think it's quite interesting. Thanks everyone. To, uh...
would he still advise using such techniques, or would he advise uh, looking at something different? You would, you would perhaps, because of the implication of resources, um, if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's like a, they call it a drop deadline, as it were, you know, you, you know, you got, it's got to be done by this time. Um, because it's like you start to lose profit and availability, and you start to crash projects, and you start to bring in resource at all costs from outside. But you would also leave yourself some contingency, so you'd be very good at risk management, so you would, you would have an effective risk management plan, you'd have contingency resources, and you would use crashing techniques. So you'd suddenly shove loads of resource onto, a, onto any problematic, you'd be on top of any problematic activity, lots of resource onto it and get it solved uh, as much as possible. Risk management though, so crashing, crashing of the, the project is important. Thank you. All right. Hiya. Um, I'm not sure. Is, is, I think there's a consistent exam date with the university. I think it's the exams office who, should, who, who deal with that. I think um, that, I don't want to say anything specific because it could be misleading. But I think um, it's, it, it's everything after everything after le everything up to lecture seven is on the MCQs, and everything after is on the exam. That might not be certain. Something like that. Or well, the, the exams office, I should say. All right. Okay. So how's yep. the um, unit split, like the course? Is it is it fifty percent uh, exam, fifty percent course? Exactly, work? exactly. exactly. So, so it's uh, it's fifty percent MCQ, fifty percent written exam. Written exam. Okay. When's the MCQ? So the MCQ, I'm not sure. I think it's around week seven. Oh, so it's before it's the exam. Yes, yeah, so it's it's kind of mid it's kind of midway through. Oh, okay. So I, I there's I will look up the I will look up the detail uh, and, and what, make what an announcement. What will be on like uh, this week and like week three, four, five, and six? So so you, you're going to get a variety of questions at MCQ level. Okay. So for example, there'll, there'll be there'll be some questions about calculations. There'll be some questions about concepts. So there'll be some qualitative, some quantitative. Um, you'll be able to see the types of questions from the past exam uh, facility. So there's past papers available, which I should be able to make available. I'll, I'll ask the Director of Education when I can do that. Um, and do you know because, uh, the tutorial next week, what, uh, what the question's going to be about? Uh, the tutorial? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's online? Oh, is it online? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, 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 the tutorial is a similar network type questions with a bit more variety so, it's, so it gives you some practice on working out the networks it's a quantitative type question but we'll also kind of look at the resource implications and the qualitative type models which are impacted on that as well and the context that's fine yeah, thank you appreciate it right. wait so the tutorial questions are going to the tutorial questions the multiple questions the multiple choice tutorial questions are going to be like the multiple choice ones you see in the mcq exam right uh, yeah, so so you will get kind of testing your understanding. The whole the whole teaching and learning concept is about um, the intended learning outcomes. So so cheers, thank you. So so if you've got a set of intended learning outcomes, it gives you a kind of this is what you should be able to do, and then there's, there's more detail about that. So. I'm kind of, if you can explain or describe or calculate different types of activities, then that's what you're intended to do. I realise there's quite a lot of content at times, and so I think practice on the past papers will give you the best leverage to know what to expect. Okay, so the exam is everything. The exam in January has to be everything. No, no, so the, the, exam, in, the exam in January is, only, is, is the latter half of the course. Whereas the MCQ is the first half, which is so what we're doing now. So basically, we have two exams addressing yes. everything. No, no, fifty percent. No, as in addressing everything in total. One addresses one half, the other. Yes, the other. exactly. Yes. So, so there is, so there are, so there is practice, but I just have to wait for it. Yes, in terms of the past papers. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, when do, but when does the very first practice stuff come out? Tutorial? So... Okay, yeah, good question. So, I need to work out when the past papers can be made available. And the kind of activities you're doing now are, are, are good indicators of, of what's important as well. Great. So hopefully, hopefully uh, everything will work out well. Yep. All right. Uh, All right. Do you, do you happen to be able to release the slides that you have on the presentation? Yes, yes. So these, these are my class slides. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll release them just now. I'll go back to the office and put these on the, uh, on the website. Yeah, because the thing is, these slides are very different from the ones we have on. Uh, yeah, a, a little different. Same in content, they look different, only. But, okay, like, for example, things like um, critical, chain project, critical chain project management, it's not even on the slides in Blackboard. So is it part of syllabus mm. or no? So the, so the critical chain is, is part of the slides at the end, Yeah. which is here. So I, what I did there was just explain, explain that in a bit more detail. Yeah. I would, I would say, though, that I would not expect you to apply critical chain. Okay. Only describe what it does. Okay. So if you understand that, that the reason why we have it, because some resources are not available, because they're on other projects, and that to mitigate that, you've got this thing called critical chain, yeah. and it puts buffers before and after where the, where the critical resources are to, to guard against delay. Yeah. Of, of, uh, uh, because of external availability problems, which is, would just be about it. Okay. okay. So you'll be releasing your set of class slides on Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so Good much. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.